honored to have had a, a godly mother, a mother who I knew growing up that my dad was always going to be, have second place in her heart. I knew that the Lord would always have first place. That's the way it should be. That's one of the things that my mom taught me, probably one of the more serious things. But there are several other things that she taught me. I thought we'd share a few of those this morning just so we could acknowledge what our mothers teach us. My mom taught me about religion. I heard her say several times, you better pray that that's going to come out of the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> my mom taught me about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. <laughs> Logic. Because I said so, that's why. <laughs> How many of our mothers taught us foresight? Make sure you wear clean underwear, just in case you're in an accident. <laughs> or irony. Keep on crying and I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> My mother taught me about the science of osmosis. She would say, shut your mouth and eat your dinner. <laughs> she would teach me about stamina. Sit there until that spinach is gone. She taught me about meteorology, the weather. She'd say, that room of yours looks like a tornado went through it. <laughs> she and Bill Cosby both taught us about the circle of life. I brought you into this world, and I'm going to take you out. <laughs> My mom taught me about genetics. She said, you act just like your father. <laughs> and immediately after that, she would begin to teach me about behavior modification, and she'd say, stop acting like your father. <laughs> She taught me about envy. She said, there are millions of children in this world who don't have the wonderful parents that you do. She taught us, our mothers all taught us about anticipation. Just wait till we get home. <laughs> in fact, soon after that, she would teach us about receiving. She would say, you're going to get it when you get home. <laughs> she would teach us, moms would teach us about medical science. She would say, if you don't stop crossing your eyes, someone's going to slap you in the back and they're going to stay that way. <laughs> Our parents and mothers especially taught us how to become adults. She would say, if you don't eat your vegetables, you're never going to grow up. <laughs> my mom taught me about my roots. She would say, shut that door behind you. You think you were born in a barn? <laughs> she taught me about wisdom. She said, when you get to be my age, you'll understand. Apparently, do. <laughs> And my mom taught me about justice. She said, one day you're going to have kids, and I hope they turn out just like that. <laughs> On this day that we honor our mothers, it is important that we think about how much they really do for us, how much they've done for us in the past if they're not with us now. But being a mother is not a walk in the park. It's not, um, it's not as easy as sometimes you guys make it look. A father was trying to explain the concept of marriage to his four-year-old daughter. And he thought that maybe some visual images would help him. So he got out the wedding, uh, wedding album and began to show her pictures. And she looked at a few of them and he explained the service to her. And, and when he was finished, he asked if she had any questions. And she said, yeah, is, is that when mommy came to work for us? <laughs> <laughs> Too often, that's the idea that we have about our moms, especially when we're younger. Studies have been done, in fact, that said that by a child, time the child reaches the age of 18, a mother has had to handle 18,000 hours of extra chores only because of that child or children. In fact, women who have never had children enjoy the equivalent of an extra three months a year in leisure time. But before I begin, I have, do have to offer this caveat. No, whatever we, what do you do when after what we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, when we talk about it and it doesn't work, what do you do then? Before we look at the biblical things of, of, of being a mother, if we do those and they don't work, then what do we do? Blame your husband. <laughs> That's the answer. Blame dad. If mom does her job and it doesn't work, it's, you got to blame dad. But if the truth be known, when a child is born, we do have two emotions. There's the emotion of great joy. A child has come into your world and, and, and you're just so filled with joy. And almost immediately following that one is the second one that says, oh my gosh, what do I do now? And for people who are soon to be parents, it really is kind of scary raising kids in the world. There are thousands of books from authors as diversified as James Dobson to Dr. Spock and Dr. Ruth. We're bombarded with suggestions and, and even demands from our own mothers on how we should raise our kids, 
Oprah and the Sally Jesse Raphael think that, that we, they know, and, and they're diametrically opposed most of the time to our own beliefs. Even our moms have arguments with us sometimes on how to raise our own kids. Just a quick glance at the TV lineup most evenings. American Idol, New Jersey Housewives, Bachelor, Bachelorette. Shows us that the world out there has different priorities than we do as Christians. They have a different priority for our children than we do as Christians, Christian moms and dads. Ellen Goodman, who is a liberal feminist, she wrote this in the Boston Globe recently. Americans once expected parents to raise their children in accordance with the dominant cultural message. Today, they're expected to raise their children in opposition to them. Once the chorus of cultural values was full of ministers, teachers, neighbors, leaders, they demanded more con conformity, but offered more support. Now the messengers are violent cartoon characters, rappers, and celebrities selling sneakers. Parents are consider considered responsible only if they're success successful in the resistance to that culture. And that's what makes child raising harder today. It's not just that American families have less time with their kids, it's that we have to spend more of that time battling our own culture. Motherhood is truly the hardest job in the world. In fact, I don't really even feel qualified to talk about it this morning. I, I thought about saying I'm not qualified and walking off the stage because that's how much I feel about it. I, I'm not qualified to tell you how to do what is really the hardest job in the world. And so this morning, instead of telling you that, I want to look at the example of someone in Scripture who was successful. Someone whose son had not only a godly mother, but a godly grandmother. And in doing that, I want you dads to know that it's not just for the moms. It is just as important for you to take these truths and apply them in your life as a, as a father as it is for the mothers. If you're a grandmother, your kids are already grown, it's never too late. If you didn't have kids, adopt some. Some of the church, there are kids are in our church today that are here without their parents, and they need someone to show them a godly example. Now, there are a lot of different portraits and scriptures of good mothers. We can look at the mother of Moses, who was willing to go against the law, put her own life on the line to protect her son. We can look at the sacrificial love of the mother who went before King Solomon and was willing to give up her baby rather than to have um, her baby killed. She would rather give it to another woman than have it suffer. The mother of James and John, we look at her often as, as someone who was arrogant and wanting her son to sit on Jesus' right and left hand. But think of the pride she had in her kids. Think of the, the, the pride she wanted them to be a part of the Lord's kingdom. But this morning I want us to take a few moments to examine Eunice, the mother of Timothy. Mother's Day is a great day to review the basics of a mother's priorities. And so in Paul's second letter to, to basically a young pastor, uh, a young man that he's taken under his wings and, and begun to train, he writes to him two letters. The first one is 1 Timothy, obviously. The second one is 2 Timothy. Very simple. But in chapter 1, verses 3-5, through 5, 2 Timothy, Apostle Paul introduces us to Timothy with these words. He says, Timothy, I thank God for you. He is the God that I serve with clear conscience, just as my ancestors did. Night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. I long to see you again, for I remember your tears as we parted, and I will be filled with joy when we are together again. I know that you sincerely trust the Lord, for you have the faith of your mother Eunice and your grandmother Phyllis. So this is Timothy, a young man Paul has, has taken under his wing. He's, he's taken, him and, taken him on mission trips, and he's trying to teach him how to be a young leader in a young church. And he reminds him, of the faith that he received, not only from his mother, but also his grandmother. Eunice was a Jewish believer in Jesus. She had grown up in the, in the Jewish faith, and somehow, uh, the scripture doesn't tell us, but she married a Gentile, a Greek, who was a non-believer. We, we really don't see or hear much about Timothy's father, except in Acts, when, when it says that Eunice was a Jewish believer in Jesus, who was married to a Greek non-believer, and that's, that's all we know. So we know right from that, that the faith that Timothy had did not come from his dad. The faith Timothy had came directly from his mother. Eunice was a wise, a spiritually strong mother. She learned her priorities at the knees of her mother. And she had passed those along as a mother to her son Timothy. And those are the same priorities that we need to be teaching our kids today. It's the 
same priorities that we need to have in our own life, but especially that we need to pass on to the next generation. And so let's listen in as Paul reviews the teaching that his young protege received, received from his mother Eunice and try to uncover those and unpack those uh, priorities that shaped <coughs> Timothy, made him who he was, so that we can apply them to our lives and to the lives of our children. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 14. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with verse 14. Paul says this to Timothy. You must remain faithful to the things that you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught them to you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have been given to you. Through them you receive the wisdom to receive salvation that comes only by trusting in Christ Jesus. The first priority that we can see in Eunice's life and in the teaching that she gave to Timothy was that she had to instill an authentic faith in her son. Even though Lois as a grandmother, Eunice as the mother, even though they had a faith, they had a belief in Jesus themselves, they had received salvation themselves, they had to make sure that Timothy came to a point where he had his own faith, that he believed on his own that Jesus was the Christ. It's not good enough if we have a faith ourselves and we don't pass it on to our children. But we also have to remember that they have to accept that on their own. Faith is hereditary. It's not something that we can pass along like an inheritance of money. It's something that has to be learned as they watch us. When mothers model genuine faith, they set up an environment in which a kid can be motivated to want that same kind of faith, that same kind of relationship with Christ. In fact, the word sincere is related to faith. Here it means non-hypocritical. It has to be a real faith. It has to be um, so real, in fact, that there's no pretense at all, no falsification for them, for that kid to see that, because they're going to understand, they're going to know if you're faking it. Faith had come up in his, in his mother. She'd grown up Jewish. She was looking for the Messiah. When Jesus was presented to her, to her, probably by the Apostle Paul, she recognized that that was the Messiah she'd been waiting for her whole life because of the teaching that her mother had given her. And so she accepted him. Her grandmother accepted Jesus as well. And he was alive and well in them, but they had to pass that on to him. Notice that chain. From grandmother to mother to son. Lois to Eunice to Timothy. Moms, if you want to instill authentic faith in your children, then you have to take your faith seriously. It can't be something that you're faking. Your children are going to know. If you're faking, they're going to know if you're not taking it seriously. If you're going through motions spiritually, your kids are going to see it. They're going to imitate that in their own lives. If on the other hand, you demonstrate your faith consistently by reading your Bible every day, by spending time in prayer, attending worship, by participating in the life and mission of the church, and you're sending a very clear message to your children of what is truly important to you. I think that there's there's a lot of times when I fail my kids, especially Noah. He'll come up and I'll be reading the Bible on, on my computer. I do that almost as much as I open up the, the actual paper copy anymore. And I'm, I'll be reading it. What are you doing? And I'm like, I'm studying or I'm reading. But I need to make sure that he knows I'm studying the Bible. I am reading the Bible. I'm spending time in God's Word. And it's the same thing for you. I think he knows that I'm doing that because I have to study for all of this, but I need to make sure. I don't need to leave it to chance. I need to make sure that he knows. He needs. Have you ever been caught with your hands folded on your knees with your head bowed by your kids? Have they ever come in and say, Mom, what are you doing kneeling there by your bed? They need to catch us doing it. They need to see us spending time in prayer, not just at dinners, not just when we wake up, not just when we go to bed. We need to spend time in prayer, lifting them up. It's not in the text, but I think that a mother who passes along a faith, a faith that's authentic, without a doubt, has to be a woman of prayer. It doesn't tell us that you just spend time in prayer, but as, as strong as Timothy was in the Word and in his relationship with Christ, she had to have been a woman who spent hours in prayer. Because any home in which faith is passed along from generation to generation to generation has to be a home where prayer is important. I can't imagine Lois not praying for Eunice. I can't imagine Eunice not spending time in prayer for Timothy. In fact, if we turn to Acts 12, 12, we see that the, the mother of John Mark, another one of 
uh, Paul's um, protege, one of his young disciples. It says that the mother of John Mark opened her home for prayer meetings right in the midst of the church being persecuted. Prayer was that important to her. Peter is in jail, and they are there praying for him that he could be released. In Acts chapter 1, 14, we see that Mary, the mother of Jesus, joined together consistently in prayer with the disciples. That's the hallmark of a godly mother. Do you spend time in God's Word? Do you spend time in prayer? The environment Timothy grew up in was an environment that was so fertile that he couldn't help but have a relationship with Christ. Both his mother and his grandmother held their faith deeply, sincerely. It was real. How, how fertile is the environment in our homes? How fertile is the environment in our families for the reproduction, the, the nurturing of authentic faith in the lives of our children and our grandchildren? Are we passing along the legacy of authentic faith? Let's continue in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read 15 again and part of 16. Starting with verse 15. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God. The second priority that we can learn here is that we have to teach our kids that the Scriptures are vitally important, and we have to do it when they start, when we first receive those kids. When they are first given to us, we need to start. Start teaching them the Scriptures while they're still young. As a devout Israelite, Eunice would have taught her, script, her son the Scriptures. She would have started at a very, very young age. Jewish boys, we know now, still, at age five, begin to systematically learn the Scriptures, so that by the time they're 12 at their bar mitzvah, they're able to quote huge passages. That's how much they know it. The word infancy, in some of your translations, some of them say childhood, others say infancy, that, that kind of points us towards a, a newborn baby. It kind of points us towards a toddler, someone who, who can't even read, probably doesn't even understand, and yet we're spending time reading the scriptures to them, and their minds can absorb that. Their minds can know, even at that young age, this is something that's important to my parents. And we can teach them the word of God. Even before you can crawl, I can picture Eunice and Lois teaching Timothy the scriptures, spending hours with him, teaching him the stories of the Old Testament, praying with him, praying for him, teaching him the things of God, making sure that he knows who Samson was and, and what God did through his life, knowing the stories of Samuel and David and Ruth and Abraham and Noah, and not just knowing the stories, but knowing how do I apply the truths of those stories to my own life. That it wasn't just a great story of what God did years ago, but if what God did then, He can also do now. And how does He apply that in our lives? They did everything that they could do to provide Timothy with an opportunity to learn all that he could about the Bible. And in essence, basically, they were living out the commands that we were given in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. God was talking to the people of Israel, and, and the word Deuteronomy basically means. To, to learn again, to remember, to, to go over. And so God is going over the laws that he has given to his people Israel. And then he tells them this. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today are to be upon your heart. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. There are times in our day when we think, man, I just don't have time to do it. And then there's hours that we spend sitting in traffic. When we could be talking to our kids about Scripture. We could be playing CDs now. It's even easier than it would have been for them. These two mothers had internalized the truth of God's Word. They had put it so deeply into who they were and how they lived that they could impress it upon young Timothy. They talked about it throughout the day. They showed him how the Scriptures impacted every area of his life. The best formula that I know for making sure that your kids know the scriptures is to bring them to church on Sunday, every Sunday. Don't skip. Make it a priority. And then apply what they learn on Sunday throughout the rest of the week. Take what they learn in their classes, Scott and Ron and, and every, all the other teachers teach, teach us, and take those truths and apply it to their lives and show them where they are applicable in a day-to-day -day walk with God. It's not just something that we learn in, in, a, in an ivory tower here, but it's something we can take and apply to our lives when we're out there in the world. Susanna Wesley 
had 19 children. And each week she would take every one of those children aside for one hour for each kid and would spend that time discussing and teaching them the principles of spiritual living. Anybody here have 19 kids? If she was able to pull it off, we could have. She is said to have prayed one hour every day for her children. So I don't know if she combined those hours or not, but she's running out of hours a day. It was a priority. But because of her devotion to the Word of God and the teaching that she implied or imparted into her son, Charles Wesley and John Wesley, that we recognize from, from church history, we recognize from our hymn, hymn books, changed two different continents, the United States and Europe, changed them for God forever <coughs> because of the teaching of their mother, Susanna. Moms, nobody's going to make you do it. Nobody's going to make you do this. You, you have to make it a priority yourself. In fact, if it's not, not for the church, the rest of the world for sure is going to make you do it. God has been removed from our public places, from our public schools. The schools faithfully teach secular humanism to our kids, and our children have little chance of growing up ever to be a Timothy, to even have any kind of a Christian value in their life without you teaching them. It's never too early to start teaching the Bible to your children, and it's never too, too late. You have to start it already. There's nothing that can replace our role in our child's life. God wants to use you to instill within the children, within your kids, the ones he has entrusted to you, to instill with them a respect for the Bible. But if you don't live it, don't bother trying to teach it. If it's not something that you do for yourself, your kids are going to know that. They're going to see that. Don't bother trying to teach it in any other way. If they don't see you living and spending time in the Word of God, they're going to learn how you live. A child who never sees his mother open the Bible from Monday to Saturday knows that Christianity is only for Sundays. But a child who sees his mother spending time in the Word of God on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday knows that the Word of God, Christianity, is something that we do every day, all day. It's who we are. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true, to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It straightens us out. It teaches us to do what is right. It is God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipping us for every good thing God wants us to do. <coughs> Third priority that we can find in the life of Eunice that we need to apply to our lives is moms, release your kids to serve. Release them to serve. Mothers, part of your job is to instill a faith. Make sure they know who Jesus is and that they know that he is their Savior. And make sure that they believe in him, that they surrender their lives to him. Make sure that they have a respect for the scriptures, that they spend time in it every day. But these are just preliminary steps leading to the most important job that we as parents have. And that is instilling within our child, children a desire to serve God. God, if he wanted us just to be saved and that's the end of it, he'd just whip us out of here straight to heaven the moment we uh, entrust our hearts to him. But he leaves us here with an intent to go and change the world for him one person at a time. But our kids can only do that when they know that that is important to us. The reason that our kids are to learn the Bible, the reason that they're to grow in their faith, is so that they can be different difference makers in the world. So they can leave this place and go be a, a light to the world, to be salt to the world, to be different than the rest of the world, so that when people look at our kids, they can say, the same as when they look at us, there's something different about them. I want to know what it is. And they can make a difference in the world around them. They need to be able to share their faith. They need to be able to minister in the church and in school. They need to serve those who are hurting. They need to serve as missionaries. They need to identify what gifts God has given them, the spiritual gifts that He has blessed them with, so that they can use them on a regular basis. But the only way they can do that is if they see us doing it, and they know it's a priority for us, and we release them to do that. The truth of the matter is this. We are saved in order to serve. We are saved so that we can take the good news of Jesus to others. Remember, just beginning of the year, when we talked about the fact that God created us to have a relationship so that we could shine His glory. He made us in His image so His image could shine. But the sin tarnished that image. And we need to show the world that through Jesus that image can be restored. That people, when they look at us, they can 
see Jesus shining out of us. We are to be disciples so that we can disciple. We are to be equipped so that we can go and evangelize and share the good news. We are sanctified, set apart for the rest of the world so that he can send us to a lost and dying world. All of Timothy's instruction, everything that his mom had put into his life, the hours that she spent praying for him and teaching him the Word of God, were there for one reason. And that was so that he could serve the Lord. It is God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipping us, for every good thing that God wants us to do. Let's listen to Paul's reason for reminding Timothy of all that his mother taught him. You know, he, he gives him all of that, and then he gives the reason, and this is what he says. I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and dead when he appears to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. Does that sound like our culture today? But he continues, But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news, fully carrying out the ministry that God has given you. Patiently correct. Work. Keep a clear mind. Be patient. Don't be judgmental. Are your children ready to, ready to serve God? Are you instilling in them a saving faith? Do they see you living out the truth that you claim to believe? Do they see you stressing out every time you're a little bit late? Do they see you stressing out every time something doesn't quite go your way? Do they see you just... Every time there's a troublesome moment in your life, do they see you doubting God? Or do they see Jesus? Do they see a spirit of forgiveness or a spirit of condemnation? Do they see sinfulness or do they see Jesus as salvation in your life? Are you preparing your kids with scripture, not only at church by bringing them, but taking them home and sharing the truth with them there? When was the last time your kids caught you reading your Bible? Do you even own one? Do you remember where it is? If you had to bring it to church, you have to dust it off first. When you leave this building, do you talk about what you learned here today? Can their children read the good news of Jesus in your everyday life? Are you leading your kids to His service? Do your children see you as generous? Or are you tight this? Have they ever seen you serve somebody else without any expectation of getting anything back in return? Do they know that you consider others? Do they know that you consider them to be more important than yourself? <clears throat> are they able to see the story of Jesus lived out in your life? Or when your kids come to you, Dad, I need something. Oh, wait a second, I've got to finish this Nintendo game or this solitaire. Or let me finish watching this show and then I'll come. Or do you, they know that you're, they are your number one priority? Mothers, I'm going to include right here in fathers. All of us here today. Mother and father is not, a, it's not an honorary title. It's a job description. We can't leave the spiritual training of our kids to, to a preacher. We can't leave it to a Sunday school teacher. We can't leave it to anybody else. When it comes to our precious kids, we need to make sure that we are doing our part in instilling in them a faith in Jesus Christ, that they know the scriptures, that they are serving. A wise man once said that an ounce of mother is worth a pound of clergy. Let me say that again. An ounce of you living out the scriptures, living out praying, living out the truth of God's word is worth a pound of me standing up here talking about it to you. Amen. When they see you doing it, it becomes real. You lead them to the Savior. You lead them and teach them the Scriptures. You prepare them to serve the Lord. Because that's what we, as parents, were created to do. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are indeed great. You've given us and blessed us with our children. Father, we just ask your forgiveness for the hours that we have wasted in not teaching them the Scriptures. 
the hours that we have spent doing things far less important, the hours that we have not spent on our knees lifting them up to you, begging you to protect them, to surround them as they leave our homes to go out into this world at whatever age they might be. Because, Father, we can't even trust our school systems nowadays with our kids knowing that they're going to be taught your truth. We have to do that ourselves.